Okay, we're ready to go. Brilliant. All right. Welcome everyone to the first press briefing of the day on Tuesday, January 12th, 2021 at the 237th meeting of the American Astronomical Society. My name is Tharani Panchati. I'm the AAS Media Fellow and I'll be your MC for this briefing. Uh, today I'll be assisted by AAS Press Officer Rick Feinberg, uh, AAS Nova Editor Susanna Kohler, and the Astrobytes Media Intern Haley Wall, who's a graduate student at West Virginia University. Rick will be handling the Q&A today. Haley will keep an eye on the press conference's Slack, and Susanna will keep an eye on everything else. Uh, there will be press releases going out for all the briefings that all the talks that will be given at this briefing. Uh, any materials associated with yesterday's press briefings, which includes the recordings and press releases have been uploaded to the press kit and linked to uh, Astronomy in the News on AAS.org. <laughs> Fairly certain that's what it is. We are recording this briefing and it's currently being live streamed to YouTube. Uh, the title of this briefing is Galaxies and Quasars 1, because we received a lot of neat and interesting abstracts on these topics. Uh, the way this works, if you haven't been to one of these briefings before, is the speakers will present concurrently, and at the end, we will have a QA. and uh, I strongly encourage you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And when you do ask a question, please be sure to include your name, affiliation, and who the question is directed at, if that's applicable. If you see that someone's asked a question that you had yourself, please feel free to upvote them and they will go up in the queue. For more general chats outside of the Q&A, you can use the Slack channel. It begins with three zeros. So our speakers today are in order. First, we have Anna Payne from the University of Hawaii, Manoa, with a periodic nuclear transient in an active galaxy. Next, we have Gaurav Kula from the University of Chicago with the discovery of the brightest galaxy in the redshift greater than five universe. Next, we have Bradford Stiles from the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian with the heavily obscured quasar in the early universe. And finally, to round us off, we have Fega Wang from the University of Arizona with the most distant quasar in the universe. And with that, I will turn it over to Anna. Okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Payne. I'm a graduate student at the Institute for Astronomy, University of Hawaii. And today I am very excited to discuss uh, my discovery that Assassin-14KO undergoes periodic flares, which we currently think uh, are caused by a repeating tidal disruption event. So even though when we look up at the night sky and to our eyes, the universe appears very static, in reality, it's an extremely dynamic place. Uh, there are numerous transient phenomena detected every day from survey data, such as from space-based surveys, such as the test mission, and ground-based surveys, such as Assassin, or the All-Sky Automated Survey for Supernova, which are discovering transients from supernova to flaring stars uh, to flaring uh, uh, galactic nuclei. And the, nu the nuclei of galaxy are, galaxies are so small and so far away that we can't resolve or image them directly, uh, but we consider a galaxy an active galaxy uh, an active galactic nucleus, or AGN, if the central black hole is actively feeding at a, red, at a relatively high rate. And so again, we can't image them directly, but if we were to, if we were to take survey data uh, of a normal AGN and plot its brightness over time to form a light curve, we would see something like this, where there, uh, the light curve is characterized by this random variation or this stochastic behavior in the light curve. So earlier this year, when I extracted the assassin light curve for this galaxy, uh, it immediately stood out. As opposed to this uh, stochastic variation, there are evenly spaced flares that have been detected for the entire duration of the assassin data, uh, so over six years, with missing flares due only to seasonal gaps. And I've been referring to this object as assassin 14KO uh, because uh, early on in 2014, 
the Assassin Transient Detection Pipeline did detect one of these early flares. Uh, at that time, it was thought to be possibly a supernova very close to the nucleus. Uh, but we know now it was not a one-time event, but was uh, one of these flares and a series of flares. And I found that these flares are uh, periodic. They occur once uh, every about 114 days. Uh, and as I'm showing here by the phase folded assassin light curve, um, the, the each flare event is, is characterized by this very rapid rise uh, to peak uh, from the quiescent baseline, and then followed by a more gradual decline. Uh, and uh, because these flares are so strongly periodic, it gives us really a unique opportunity to be able to predict uh, when upcoming flares will occur. And the first flare that was uh, that we correctly predicted happened in May 2020. Uh, I requested SWIFT data to investigate these flares from a multi-wavelength approach uh, and to monitor its evolution, uh, which revealed for the first time that these flares uh, brighten in near unison in the UV and optical. The picture became even clearer in the next flare in September 2020, which again was correctly predicted. Uh, which revealed, again, just how consistent these flares are between events. The x-rays did not follow the same behavior as the UV and optical. Uh, instead, uh, the x-ray flux decreased uh, as the UV and optical brightened. So not only are we lucky in that these flares are periodic, so we can study them over and over again, but we're also very lucky in that one complete flare was uh, observed by TESS very early on in the TESS mission uh, over sectors uh, four to six. So TESS, which images a patch of sky every 30 minutes, provides a really amazing light curve that we never would have been able to predict, uh, that we never would have been able to obtain from the ground. And the combination of TESS's photometric precision, precision and cadence really brought into focus this dramatic rise, only lasting five days, followed by this very gradual decline. And in general, this very smooth evolution with very little low level variability uh, superimposed on top of the flare is very reminiscent of light curves of tidal disruption events or TDEs. And so these occur when a star has a close encounter with a black hole, uh, the tidal forces overwhelm the star's self-gravity and it becomes torn apart and destroyed in the process. Uh, the result is this luminous flare, uh, which some stellar material orbits the black hole and the remainder is ejected outwards as this streamlight formation. So this is a one-time event. The star is completely destroyed in the process. Uh, repeating TDEs have been theoretically predicted for years, uh, but until now they've remained observationally elusive. So repeating TDEs could happen if the star passes close to the black hole but survives the encounter, uh, only losing a part of its mass, uh, resulting in a luminous flare per event and per orbit. And this fits the description for Assassin 14KO uh, because we've seen these flares happen uh, for years now. Uh, and based on the luminosity and duration of the flares, uh, the mass loss is expected to be only very small, only about three Jupiter masses per event. So it would make sense that a very massive star could repeatedly survive dozens or hundreds of encounters. Uh, also, this is very similar to other TDEs previously studied in that we know that it is uh, UV bright. So for the third time now, Assassin 14KO has flared right on schedule. Uh, the latest flare occurred just three weeks ago uh, and there still remain questions about Assassin 14KO, but my holiday gifts this year were being awarded time on all these telescopes uh, shown here, but one of the luckiest gifts of all was that uh, the flare was again visible by TESS uh, during the last three sectors. So although there still remains some mysterious aspects about this unusual object, uh, it's not only a unique object, but it's a rather forgiving object in that it is repeatedly giving us, a, repeatedly giving us more opportunities to study it. Uh, thank you, and I'll pass the mic to the next speaker. Thank you, Anna. Um, let me just stop. Um, hopefully, uh, you all can see my screen here. Uh, thank you very much for having uh, having me uh, today. Uh, my name is God of Color. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. Today, I am representing uh, the University of Chicago, the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, the Kaldi Institute for Cosmological Physics, and uh, the newly minted Cool Lamps collaboration, the Chicago Optically Selected Lenses located at the margins of public surveys. 
Um, today I'm talking about our, the first discovery out of this collaboration, the brightest galaxy in the Redshift 5 universe. Um, and uh, the partial arc-like thing that you're seeing on the left is Cool J1241, the galaxy uh, in, in question. Um, a really quick primer on gravitational lensing. Uh, lensing magnifies distant galaxies. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, lensing, especially strong gravitational lensing, is this cosmic phenomenon where if light that is emitted by distant galaxies uh, passes by massive objects in the universe uh, as it travels towards us, the gravitational field from these intermediary objects uh, can distort or bend light. Even light that is emitted from this galaxy that is otherwise headed in directions uh, different from ours, uh, this is lensing. Um, so strong lensing can actually result in some of these uh, so, such strongly bent light that uh, there are multiple images of these galaxies formed, as you can see from the video. And you, these are often seen as uh, rings or partial rings um, or arc-like structures. One such galaxy is Cool J1241. Uh, this is the brightest galaxy observed from when the universe was uh, less than 1.2 billion years old or approximately less than one-tenth of its current age. Um, so what we've done here is we've been able to discover this extremely bright galaxy that has been lensed by an intermediate galaxy cluster, which you're seeing as the orange uh, point-like galaxies uh, in this field. Uh, why is this exciting? Um, I think this is fascinating for many different reasons. One of them being where this galaxy actually sits in the evolutionary history of the universe, all the way from the Big Bang uh, to the current age of the universe. Uh, the epoch of reionization is this time period of a few hundred million years uh, in the early universe, which is this major transition point uh, from a dark universe that was filled with neutral hydrogen and was pretty much opaque uh, to a universe that is slowly getting reionized by photons from stars and newly formed galaxies. Um, so the formation and duration of this epoch of reionization is of extreme interest to astronomers. There are many talks at uh, this AAS meeting related to this, but so are the galaxies that have spent a major chunk of their evolutionary histories in this time period. And Cool J1241 at this redshift of five is approximately, uh, is, is, is one such galaxy. Um, our publication, uh, which was accepted in the Astrophysical Journal uh, this past November, is titled Cool Lamps 1. This is the first paper out of our collaboration. Um, this extraordinarily bright lens galaxy at Russia 5.04. Uh, what we've done is we've basically done a comprehensive spectrum, uh, a spectral and photometric characterization of this galaxy um, uh, using data from the Magellan telescopes, um, as well as uh, the Gemini North Telescope on Mauna Kea. Uh, one thing that I would like to point out here is that uh, we've taken public data from uh, this public survey known as TCALS, the Dark Energy Camera Legacy Survey, so I want to make sure I give a shout out to them. Uh, a few details about why this galaxy is fascinating. Um, we've been able to, with follow-up data, confirm the spectrum of the galaxy, confirming its redshift and distance in orange. As you can see, it's similar to a template galaxy at a similar redshift in cyan. This is ultraviolet data, but because we are receiving photons from this galaxy at a time that is at redshift uh, of five, uh, we were able to do these observations in the optical and near infrared regime. This is spectroscopy from the Magellan telescopes and the Gemini North telescope. We've also modeled this galaxy using stellar population synthesis. Uh, this is one of the cu cutting edge techniques to understand uh, galaxy properties and potentially their evolutionary histories. Uh, what you're seeing on the plot here uh, at the bottom is the, the number of potential suns formed per year or solar masses uh, worth of masses formed per year um, as a function of age of the galaxy. And what we're essentially claiming here is that this is consistent with the galaxy that's been forming stars cons constantly. But the fascinating part here is that it has formed stars within a few times that of the Milky Way um, in actually just one tenth of the time and at a much, much earlier time in the history of the universe. Um, finally, uh, I'd just like to say a couple of words about the Cool Lamps collaboration itself. This is uh, a project that was actually the central focus of an undergraduate research class at the University of Chicago, where the objective was to find strong gravitational lenses in recent public imaging data. These are objects specifically discovered at the margins of the distributions of source color and brightness. We performed with the help of our collaborators, which is 11 undergraduate students at UChicago, the lead graduate student that is me, and uh, the PI instructor, uh, Professor Mike Ladders. Uh, 
we've done rapid visual examinations of half a million lines of sight to find these exquisite, exquisite objects. Uh, this week at AAS, uh, uh, I'll be giving a talk uh, later this afternoon uh, with some of the science results in this publication. We'll also be talking about the Cool Lamps collaboration later this week. Please check out on Wednesday uh, two eye posters by Michael Martinez and Ezra Suke, uh, my fellow uh, collaborators and students, um, talking about other discoveries from Cool Lamps. And with that, um, I'll stop here and pass the mic. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Well, so I'm going to talk. Well, firstly, my name is Bradford Snyles. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. I'm going to talk today about a, a recent discovery of a heavily obscured quasar found in the early universe. This work was led by myself in collaboration with all those listed on the slide here. Ooh, let me just, there we go. So to start off, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to take a moment just to talk a bit about what quasars are, as uh, while they are somewhat similar to the topics we've already been discussing in the first two uh, presentations, they're a bit of an exotic flavor of what we call an active galaxy. Uh, a quasar itself is generally defined by being an extremely luminous galaxy, wherein the supermassive black hole at the center of it will power very strong emission, generally in the form of jetted outflows. You can see an example of a nearby quasar, that is Centaurus A on the right here, where the supermassive black hole resides at the center of that dusty torus region in the center. And then you have these large scale jets that are emitted from that black hole that where the jets themselves are larger than the galaxy that the black hole is residing in. So we're talking about very energetic, very luminous energy and emission. I mentioned that this is a supermassive black hole, the center, and uh, for the quasars I'm going to be talking about today, uh, this is very accurate. A black hole in this category is usually about one billion times more massive than that of our sun. And uh, <clears throat> as I've kind of been alluding to here, quasars sort of defining characteristic is that they're extremely luminous. In fact, they're some of the most luminous objects in the universe. And that makes quasars quite unique in that we're able to observe them at very far distances away. You'll hear a lot about that in this talk as well as the following. So my collaborators and I have been focusing on quasar formation specifically in the early universe. <clears throat> now to form that supermassive black hole at the center of the quasar, you have to have a black hole consume large quantities of matter for a long period of time. And in doing so, it's a rather violent process where you're going to create a lot of dust and debris that will be surrounding your supermassive black hole, ultimately obscuring the system. On the right, I'm showcasing just an artist illustration of that, where you can see this large dusty torus surrounding that central supermassive black hole where the jets are emitted from. And we can even see a cutout in that dust to, to see through that center region. But for our, a typical source, especially at this line of sight, that central region is very much obscured by the dust and debris. So we really can't resolve that, at least through standard methods, which I'll talk more about in the coming slides. Now, <clears throat> based on several different models of the early universe, uh, where we assume properties of, of uh, stellar formation, black hole formation rates, and overall uh, density of dust and gas, uh, the vast majority of quasars in the early universe are predicted to be heavily obscured, where so much so that you're basically not going to have much, if any, light really emitted from that central region, or at least not, well, you have a lot emitted, but not a lot to be able to penetrate through that dust and gas. Now, despite that prediction, the vast majority of the quasars detected in the early universe seem to be unobscured rather than obscured. <clears throat> with only three known obscured quasars detected in the early universe prior to this research. Uh, for those that speak redshift, that is a redshift of uh, roughly about greater than four, which corresponds to about 15% of the current age of the universe. So we really are looking back into the very early stages of the universe. This discrepancy between what we see in the models and what we're actually observing is a uh, quite interesting as it calls into question whether the missing quasar population is due to either invalid models 
or if we're simply using invalid observation methods to detect this obscured population. Now, my colleagues and I have been working on using alternative methods and alternative techniques to detect that quasar population. And one of the best ways to do so is by using X-ray observatories. X-rays are generally not obs readily obscured by dust and debris. Anyone that's gone for a medical X-ray exam should be sort of familiar with the fact that X-ray is really good at penetrating through objects. And that makes X-ray observatories uh, uniquely capable of detecting very obscured sources like these obscured quasars. To that end, we use the Chandra X-ray Observatory to survey X-rays from a sample of several different quasars. All targets from our sample were selected from a radio catalog of young quasars. Um, as uh, typically quasars that are radio bright are also X-ray bright. So we were hoping that by selecting known radio bright sources, we would subsequently find also X-ray bright. Now, I don't have time to go through all the details of that analysis, but uh, I will say that this work was published in the Astrophysical Journal in July of this past year. Uh, but I do want to highlight one source from that uh, result, and that is the Quasar J1606 plus 3124. If you have a catchier name for this source, please do let me know. <laughs> uh, this source is, uh, again, a radio bright quasar that we used, we analyzed X-ray observations of and found indeed that this source is X-ray bright and <clears throat> in also is um, located at about 10% the current age of the universe or at a redshift of about 4.56. J1606 demonstrates a significant reduction in optical and UV emission. Uh, you can see that on the image on the, the right here where the optical image taken from the PanStars All Sky Survey uh, should showcase J1606, should be in that green box. And if you look, squint, and just kind of get it at the right angle, you can see that there is something there, but it's certainly not bright. <clears throat> but when we compare that to what we see in the X-ray in the same field of view, there's very clearly a bright point source, and that's part of the sky, and that is indeed the quasar we're looking for. From our spectroscopic analysis, we verified that it is indeed a heavily obscured quasar making this the fourth confirmed obscured quasar in the early universe. Now that in of itself would be an exciting discovery, but J1606 has one more surprise in store for us, and that is its luminosity. When we compare the luminosity of J1606 to other obscured quasars that have been detected in the early universe, we found that J1606 was anywhere from 10 to 10,000 times brighter than any other obscured quasar that had been discovered. This subsequently confirms the presence of high luminosity obscured quasars in the early universe, which can further constrain those quasar evolution models. Some models had previously stated that these types of high luminosity obscured sources were either improbable to, in some cases, impossible. With the presence of J1606, that is clearly refuted. Now, this source is really just giving us the tip of the iceberg in terms of its information, as this was a rather shallow exposure in terms of X-ray observation. And so there's a lot more information we wanna learn about it, including the composition of that dust and gas, the overall geometry of the source and its alignment with us, and overall light curve statistics, seeing how this source is evolving in brightness over time. Uh, to that end, we uh, proposed and were approved for follow-up x-ray observations that will be taking place later this year. And so uh, do expect to hear more about J1606 in the coming months to years, as it really does have a lot more to tell us about this obscured quasar population. And so with that, I'll simply summarize. Uh, <clears throat> my colleagues and I used x-ray observations to detect uh, the quasar J1606 and verify it to be an obscured source located at about 10% the current age of the universe. This makes it the fourth quasar of this classification identified, and it's also the brightest obscured quasar ever detected in the early universe. <clears throat> the presence of J1606 does answer some questions about quasar evolution, but it also presents some further interesting questions, such as can a single evolution model incorporate this level of quasar diversity we're seeing? or is quasar production significantly different from what we're predicting? These are the kind of questions we hope to answer with both further studies of this particular source and, also, and additional surveys to find more of these types of sources. And uh, with that, I'll end things off here and uh, turn it over to our final speaker.
Uh, thank you, Brian. Hey, Rick, can you start my video? It's started by you. Uh, hello, everyone. Firstly, uh, I'm Figo Wang, a Hubble Fellow from the University of Arizona. Today, I'm going to report the discovery of the most distant quasars, a quasar uh, even more distant than those reported by previous speakers. And uh, this work is recently accepted for publication in the APG letters, and the preprint can be found on the archive. Uh, First of all, I would like to briefly introduce why we care about the distant quasars. Those distant quasars are powered by the earliest supermassive black holes and hosted by the massive galaxies in the early universe. So by starting those quasars, we can have more insights on the formation of the first generation supermassive black holes and the assembly of the earliest massive galaxies. You know, they think those quasars are really well into the epoch of the renaissance, the major transition phase of our universe. And by looking at those quasars, we can study the diffuse, the diffuse gas in, our, in the universe at the epoch of the renaissance. Uh, so how, the first question we want to ask is how to find those kind of distant quasars. Since they are very far away from us, the light are red safety and also the light at the blue world of the lemma alpha emission line would be absorbed by the diffuse gas in our uh, universe, so the we, you you cannot see any flux from the distant quasar in the optical, as shown here. This is a pine star optical imaging of five different maps, and also deeper legacy imaging survey also in the optical. You cannot see anything here, but it's well detected in the infrared here. So the one point two micron, the two micron, three micron, and the four micron from with the imaging survey and the wide space middle infrared imaging surveys. So those objects are detected in the infrared, but not detected in the optical. But this is not the only object that has such kind of color. There are many, many more uh, cool stars in our Milky Way also have similar colors. So in order to find the distant quasars, we also need to uh, take a spectroscopy in order to confirm whether it's a quasar or it's contaminants from our Milky Way. Uh, finally, in the last year, we discovered a quasar J0313-1806 at Recif 7.6. Uh, this quasar was first discovered with the Magellan telescope and then formally confirmed with Gemini North, Gemini Source and the Keck Observatory. And here is so the spectra of this quasar. You can see that this is the most obvious feature here is the lemma alpha emission line from the quasar. And at the blue world of the emission line, there is no any flux. This is because of absorption from uh, diffuse, diffuse gas in our universe. And also you can see some other emission lines in the red world of the spectrum. Uh, so what does a Recif 7.6 uh, mean here? Here's so the cosmic epoch cartoon of our universe. And you, after the Big Bang, the dark age, as we have heard about the epoch of renaissance, and this object is well deep into the epoch of renaissance, like it's close to the peak of the uh, epoch of renaissance, and also it hosts a 1.6 billion solar mass black hole. It's really massive. It's about two times more ma massive than the previous uh, Recif record holder, which has a 0.8 billion solar mass black hole at Recif 7.5. So the existence of such a massive supermassive black hole at when the universe is only 600 and a million years after the Big Bang really uh, puts our understanding of the, the formation of the first uh, supermassive black holes. In this plot, I'm showing the growth history of the, uh, di all the different uh, distant quasars and the uh, wet lines so of the object we recently discovered, the G0313. So on this plot, you can see there is a, a straight line here, which we assume the uh, maximum accretion since it formed in the very early universe, like after the formation of the first generation stars. So if you're tracing back, uh, to the early universe, we basically can give a low limit constraint on the seed black hole mass. And by the discovery of this quasar that requires the seed black hole mass to be more massive than 10,000 solar masses. Uh, for com as a comparison, the pop three stars or the first generation stars in our universe can only produce a black hole remnant with a mass about a few, few tens to a few hundred solar masses. So 
the discovery of this quasar is really silencing our uh, understanding of the supermassive black hole formation theory. Uh, in addition to the massive supermassive black hole, the other feature we observed from this quasar is here. By looking at the spectra, there is some absorption troughs here. If you zoom in here, we can see two blue troughs here. Those absorption troughs are caused by the absorption from the so-called quasar outflow of the wind launched from the accretion disk. So by starting the uh, spectra we observed, we can measure the velocity of those outflows. Uh, we measure the velocity of these two absorption troughs to be about from 10% of speed of light up to 20% of the speed of light. So this is a really high velocity outflow and it's a very rare phenomenon uh, even in the local universe. So the discovery of such high velocity outflows is really uh, helping us to understand how the so-called quasar feedback or the quasar outflow uh, affecting the whole, the formation of the whole galaxy. And in order to study the host galaxy, we also observed this quasar with ALMA to uh, detect uh, both the dust emitting from the host galaxy and also the gas emitting from the host galaxy. From the ALMA observations, we measure that the host quasar host galaxy is producing new stars at a rate about 200 times that of our Milky Way. Uh, but those star formation is very concentrated. The, the host galaxy is very small. It's only about 10 times smaller than that of our Milky Way. So the combination of the high star formation rate in a very compact region and the uh, appearance of the extremely high velocity outflow in the quasar makes this system to be a very ideal target for the future James Webb Space Telescope observations in order to study the connection between the quasar feedback and the star formation at cosmic dawn. Uh, so I would uh, briefly summarize here. Uh, we discovered this new quasar at Recife 7.6. It is the most distant quasar known to date, and it hosts a 1.6 billion solar mass black hole in the center. And also it, it shows very high velocity outflows uh, with a maximum speed up to 20% of the speed of light. And also the luminosity of the quasar is thousand times more luminous than the Milky Way. And its host galaxy is producing about uh, two times, 200 times uh, stars than our Milky Way. Uh, and uh, at the end, I would like to highlight that this work is done by collaborating from a lot of international teams from five different countries. And we had, uh, we thanks to the, to the great observatory support, support from Alma, Gemini, Kike, and Magellan. And also we used uh, the public imaging surveys from the Desi Imaging Survey, PanStars, the Waste Infrared Imaging Survey, and the WISE Space Imaging Survey. And also we set uh, the funding spots, and also we thank the public information officers from all those observatories. I will be stopped here and happy to take any questions. Thank you, everyone. Uh, before we get into the Q and A, uh, just a reminder that the press releases associated with this briefing will be shared on the WAS website under Astronomy in the News, and they'll also be tweeted from AAS underscore Press on Twitter. And I will hand it over to you, Rick. Okay. Well, we do have uh, a number of questions queued up um, and we've had a little bit of upvoting. So uh, I'll take them in order. Uh, the first question is for Anna and it's from Hobert Schilling, who's a freelancer in the Netherlands. Uh, he asks, is the repeating uh, tidal disruption event the only viable explanation for the repeating active galactic nucleus or are there other potential mechanisms? Thank you, yeah, great question. Uh, so in our paper, we did also explore other options uh, besides the repeating partial tide disruption event. And um, there are some, there are uh, inconsistencies with that scenario uh, given our current suite of data. Uh, so first we also considered the scenario where it's a, a, a supermassive black hole binary system uh, where there are two black holes interacting uh, to produce the flares, uh, but there are two big inconsistencies with this. Uh, the first of which is that there is a theoretical prediction for the, um, the expected period derivative. And I didn't have time to go into it in this talk, but we also measure a period derivative uh, in addition to an average period for the um, periodicity of the flares. And uh, so this theoretical prediction due to the emission of gravitational waves, um, it's uh, our observed period derivative is an order of magnitude larger than that estimate. Um, 
And the second main inconsistency with a supermassive black hole binary system is that we, we don't detect any velocity shifts in the spectra. We did take uh, some spectroscopic observations uh, during the flare and the uh, emission lines, uh, they, don't, they don't shift left or right. There's not a detection of like a redshift or blue shift, which we would expect if there are two very massive objects interacting and orbiting around each other. Uh, the second scenario that we also uh, investigated was instead of two supermassive black hole binary, uh, two, two of them in a binary system, there's uh, one black hole and one perturbing star. Uh, and so if the star is not being tidally disrupti disrupted, uh, then the flares uh, we would assume to be driven by these periodic disturbances in accretion flows um, as it's passing through the accretion disk. Uh, but this doesn't really make sense when looking at the, the phase folded light curve. We see that the, 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 the flares are very consistent with each other uh, over time and the shapes are not really changing, which we would expect to see if there's a star striking the accretion disk at different locations uh, because the accretion disk ha at different locations has different temperatures. Um, also, if it's moving uh, towards us or away from us, striking the accretion disk differently, we'd expect there to be imprinted uh, some signature of the, of the flare profile, which we don't detect um, with, the, with the six years of, of uh, individual flare events. And Govert has a uh, follow-up question too, which is, um, is the test data of December uh, available already? Have you seen it? Yeah, thank you. Uh, also a great, a great question. Um, so not yet. So actually uh, this was observed by uh, test sectors um, 30, uh, 33, 32, and 31. And actually sector 33 uh, is ending tomorrow. So the sector is not even over yet. Uh, and then it'll be downlinked uh, afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question is also for you. It's from um, Yvette Sendes, a freelancer. There was another group that suggested that Assassin 14KO has a second AGN. And she gives a, um, a preprint reference. How does this affect the idea that a partial TDE is responsible? I'm particular, particularly curious because AGN do a lot of flaring activity. So could the periodic nature be explained by the second black hole? Now you did uh, address that um, implicitly in your last answer, but I'll let you uh, elaborate. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so again, as I mentioned before, uh, we don't really, uh, considering the inconsistencies with the uh, scenario of, um, of two black holes um, that I mentioned earlier, we don't think it's the most likely scenario. Um, and also from, from that paper, um, which was led by also fellow grad student Michael Tucker uh, at um, also part of our research group, um, we found that the mu separation is about uh, uh, over 4,500 light years away um, between each other. Um, which we're able to obtain because of the, the really beautiful MUSE IFU data. Um, so that in, co in combination with the, the inconsistencies uh, of, the, of the data I mentioned before, we don't think it's um, as likely. So if I hear you right, you're saying there could be, there probably are two black holes, but they're far enough apart that the flaring is coming from just the one and it's caused by a star, partial TDE. Yes, that's true. Okay. And okay. Uh, yeah. Great. All right, uh, the next question is for Gurov Kuller from uh, Ethan Siegel of the Starts with a Bang blog. Uh, you mentioned that this is the brightest galaxy at a redshift greater than five and that it has approximately the same stellar mass as the Milky Way, despite being only a tenth of the age. How much brighter is this than the previous record holder from this time? And how challenging is a continuous star formation rate of 100 to 1,000 solar masses per year for current theories? Thanks, Rick. Uh, thank you, Ethan, for, for two really great questions. Um, so this galaxy, Cool J1241, is approximately five times brighter than the previous record holder around Redshirt 5. So I think it was a galaxy discovered, uh, uh, again, lensed uh, via the uh, Red Sequence Cluster Survey back in 2002. In fact, the PI of this project, Mike Gladders, uh, wrote the paper um, back then. Um, and uh, yeah, you're right that this is approximately the same star mass as the Milky Way. So I think within a factor of two to three, uh, given the uncertainties in our modeling, uh, despite being one tenth the age. Um, we uh, think that interesting things are happening in the evolutionary history of this galaxy in the sense that um, having a continuous star formation rate of 100 to 1000 solar masses per year at this time in the universe, uh, like in the early universe is not unheard of, but uh, 
the interesting thing that we are seeing in our modeling uh, of the uh, extant data is that uh, there's very little uh, dust attenuation. Uh, the UV emission from this galaxy, uh, the, the, at least the continuum emission, is uh, pretty pretty constant. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of emission lines that are signature of starburst galaxies. So we are um, a little bit cautious in terms of uh, uh, talking about this, this challenge in terms of uh, how mass is getting accreted in this galaxy. What we're really looking for at this point of time, uh, post this publication, is data from other telescopes that are uh, going to enable us to do this comprehensive multi-wavelength characterization. So right now, for example, we're waiting for radio data from the VLA. Uh, we've got Hubble Space Ob uh, Telescope observations in the queue. Uh, and we really, really hope to uh, combine those with, it, with current data and potential JWST observations to really paint a proper picture of um, you know, young, intermediate, and old stellar populations in this galaxy. Uh, that might, might put, put like a... a, a you know, uh, might give us like a really good answer to that very specific question about the modes of star formation and the brightest galaxies in this epoch and potentially uh, saying whether this is a unique galaxy uh, or whether this is a common occurrence in galaxies that have just come out of the epoch of reionization. So hopefully that answers this a little bit. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next question. Uh, this is for uh, Fega Wang from Leah Crane of New Scientist. Can you talk a little bit about how the quasar outflow could be connected to the rapid rate of star formation in the host galaxy? Thanks, this is a really great question. So there are some theories to discuss about the, how the quasar outflow can affect the star formation in galaxies. Like uh, the most popular theory is about the Reducing from the quasar the outflow can hit the gas in the host galaxy and thus prevent the star formation in the quasar host galaxy, the so-called quenching. But currently, there's no way to test this on this system because it's beyond the limit of current facilities. But with the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, we can really study where the outflow is and how the outflow gas is interacting with the uh, gas in the host galaxies and then to have a better understanding of how the uh, quasar outflow can connect it to the star formation in the quasar host galaxy. All right, very good. So we're looking forward to the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope this year. At least that's what we hope. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, two more questions for you, Fega. This first one's yep. from uh, Govert Schilling again, freelancer. Um, what is the most likely explanation for the rapid growth of a 1.6 billion solar mass black hole at such an early time? Or do you really have no clue at all? Uh, that's also a great question. So since, as you mentioned, the quasar is young and the universe is young, so there is really no time for them to grow. But there are some alternatives, like if you can have a massive seed black hole, like if you can produce a, a seed black hole with mass more than 10,000 10, solar masses, then you can grow such kind of supermassive black holes. Uh, there is one possible uh, possibility is the so-called direct collapse black hole, which is formed from the direct collapsing of the primordial gas. It's not forming stars, it's collapsing from the gas directly. So in this way, they can form a massive uh, seed black hole. But this scenario needed to be tested in the future with the uh, actual observations of the very early universe. And of course, the other way is to start in the green time. As I mentioned, the, 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 those lines I, I showed in the presentation is assuming the adenine accretion, which is a maximum accretion for the standard accretion. Uh, but there are some theories to uh, propose some out, uh, other ways, like uh, they possibly have some super adenine accretion. It's like uh, accreting faster and it can make the black hole grow faster. So you do not need that much time, but this is also very hard to test currently because the such kind of super energy accuracy can only happen in the very, very early phase, like when the universe is much younger than the, like the weather quasar is now. So we really need future facilities to distinguish these two different uh, scenarios. Okay, and uh, the next question uh, back to uh, Ethan Siegel from Starts With a Bang. Uh, is there any, any expectation that this quasar and the intense star formation would have quenched, uh, sorry, 
let's see, is there any expectation that this quasar and the intense star formation would have quenched this somehow? And how do we reconcile the observations with our theories for how it could be this bright and active while so young? Uh, thanks. I think this, this question is related to the first qu question about how the uh, quasar outflow can, mm -hmm. whether it's quenching the star formation in the host galaxy or not. Uh, again, we still need to wait for the launch of GWST. And also we will have the, we expect to have some higher resolution observations with ALMA to better understanding the distribution of the star formation in the galaxy. And as I said, the James Webb will tell you where the gas is from the quasar outflow and the ALMA can tell you where the gas from the uh, quasar host galaxy. So if you can like map the distribution of both quasar outflow gas and the star formation gas, then you can have a better understanding how the, whether the quasar outflow is quenching the star formation or not. My understanding is that ALMA is still offline as a result of the pandemic, but do you plan to uh, submit a proposal to observe this quasar with ALMA as soon as it's possible to do so? Yeah. Great. Okay, well, that's it for the questions that are in the Q&A box at the moment. Um, I have a, quest a couple of questions actually for Brad Snyos. Um, the first is that when you showed the image of the, uh, the PanStars view versus the um, Chandra view, um, in the PanStars view, it appeared that there were two spots roughly equally distant on either side of the, um, of the box where the quasar was. And I was wondering if those are just background objects or if they're related to the quasar in some, some way. Sure, so those um, objects are, I guess, actually foreground objects. They're closer to us than the actual quasar itself, but those would probably be um, stars within our galaxy or something to that effect. So far enough yeah, apart that they're not related. Yeah, it was interesting because of the, the way they made a, a straight line. So I thought, well, maybe they're you know, uh, radio lobes or some such thing, but interesting. Um, another question for you is that you, you mentioned that this um, object is 10 to 10,000 times brighter uh, than uh, other ones like it. And I'm just wondering why the range is so long. Where does your principal uncertainty come from? Sure, so we have our value very well constrained. The problem is that the other obscured quasars that have been detected are in some cases just uh, rough limits. Uh, the, these particular sources are, uh, tend to require very long exposures to actually get a proper handle on the actual luminosity of them. Uh, in comparison to our source J1606, which actually with a rather shallow exposure, we were able to very tightly constrain. So, you know, um, and in addition to that, the other three sources that have been found, there is uh, maybe two to three orders of magnitude difference even amongst them. But despite that, they're all significantly lower than what you would expect for a typical quasar at that distance. Whereas J1606 is uh, more online with a the upper end of what you would expect for a luminosity from a quasar. Okay. Um, just had a nice uh, little photo bomb there from Haley's cat. Uh, <laughs> um, my, my next question is for both you and uh, Fega. Um, I think you just kind of hinted at what the answer might be. Um, I was gonna ask uh, both of you if, if we can expect to find more such objects very, very distant uh, unusual galaxies and quasars uh, in the Rubin Observatory Sky Survey that's coming, or if it's going to, uh, or if because those exposures are short, um, even though it's an eight meter telescope, if we're going to have to wait for uh, the 30 meter telescopes before we expect to get, you know, be able to do some serious population statistics on objects like this that are so very far away and so young. Uh, I think I can answer it for the unobscured quasars and then Brad talk about the obscured quasars. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the unobscured quasar, the Rubin Observatory uh, can increase the number by a lot, but only limited to receive the uh, smaller than seven because it's an optical telescope, right? So at uh, higher receive to the light of the quasar is received to the infrared. So you really need the uh, infrared telescope to do so. Uh, but as a combination of the Rubin telescope and the and the Zulman Space Telescope, then you can discover more quasars at receive beyond seven or re even receive beyond eight, because the uh, Rubin Space Telescope will cover the infrared imaging, and the uh, Rubin uh, Telescope will give you the optical so-called dropout uh, 
uh, imaging. So by com combining these two, then you can find more quasars that are relative beyond seven or even eight. Okay, so combination of Rubin and Roman will, yeah. will really be the key. And, and Roman is expected in sort of the second half of the 2020s, I think. Yeah. So not, so. not that long to wait, really. <laughs> yeah. Brad, what about for the obscured quasars? The obscured quasars are obviously going to be more difficult to locate, hence the, the nature of the, the beast. Um, typically for an obscured quasar, they're going to be most attenuated at the optical and UV wavelengths, which is a bit of a problem when they're very close by. But as uh, Phage already kind of mentioned that when you start to look at these very distant objects, you have to account for the redshift change for them. So what we're looking at in optical wavelengths observed if you actually adjust that to the, the rest frame of the object that it was being emitted, that's a much, much higher energy emission and could even be up so, to UV and looking into soft X-ray in those types of bands. And depending on how obscured they are, those actually might shine through quite brightly. So it's possible that we would be able to detect them, but it, a lot of it sort of depends on just how obscured these sources are. Okay, and I have a final question, this one for uh, Gaurav Kohler. Um, you mentioned that you and, and the uh, undergraduate students actually manually looked through a half a million objects. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, how come you, <laughs> you didn't use a citizen science type project or machine learning or something like that to help you? It's, it sounds like a Herculean task. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think there are a couple of ways I can answer this. One is that uh, we are specifically looking for these like extremely you know, uh, reddish and brightest sources, since hence the name of the collaboration, objects at the margins of these public surveys in the parameter space of color and, and magnitude. Um, it turns out that machine learning is really good for looking for lenses on galaxy scales, so galaxy, galaxy, galaxy lensing. Uh, not so much at the moment when it comes to galaxy cluster lensing. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think the other thing that I would like to mention here is that um, we actually did not know that we would be looking at half a million lines of sight when we started the project. So as I mentioned, uh, this was literally a, a classroom uh, called Field Course in Astronomy and Astrophysics based on this thing called Cure Pedagogical Techniques, which is course-based undergraduate research experience. The idea was to go to Magellan and follow up some of these cool objects that even look through these lines of sight, rank them on the lens ranker or something. Um, unfortunately, uh, the pandemic uh, happened like a week before we were supposed to go to Chile, which was unfortunate. Um, but remote observing came to rescue here and um, we were able to you know, discover this object. Um, and actually, I, sh I should also mention that one of the biggest uh, advantages of also looking through data manually for students, um, and such as myself, even though I'm a grad student, is you get to look at the different kinds of lenses that, that are out there. Like you're looking at, you're looking at like hundreds of thousands of images over a month or, or, or a couple of weeks, and you get to see the data with your own eyes. And I think that's really powerful from a pedagogical standpoint, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm glad I asked that question then. Okay, Tharani, um, it looks like we're uh, wrapped up then as far as the questions go. Great, thank you. Uh, Haley, is there anything in the Slack? No, I don't see anything. Really? Okay. Um, we do have a little bit of time yet left. So I actually had a question for Anna. Um, in the test like curve of one of the flares, the Test data points appeared kind of scattered around the general trend of the flare. Could you comment on that? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, so yes, even though there's a very high photometric precision, there's still noise as any instrument. So that is that's just due to noise around the baseline. Great, thank you. Great. Seeing as there are no more questions left. Okay, cool. I guess, well, for one, I would like to thank all of our speakers for some really great talks. And I'd also like to thank the audience, both on this call and on the YouTube live stream for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank the public information officers who helped with the press releases and the prep that went into this briefing. Uh, our next briefing of the day will be at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The topic, this is a fun one, would highly recommend stopping by. Sloan, the energizer bunny of sky surveys. And we hope to see you there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.